Welcome into the Action Network podcast presented by BetMGM. Brendan Glasheen hosting today's episode. We're joined by Brandon Anderson, Action Network NFL expert. Early NFL long shots. We are recording 10 days into the month of May, and we can't get enough of the National Football League. We're welcoming back Brandon, who has scoured his very early NFL futures card to identify uh, some of his favorite long shots heading into the 2024 season. Uh, nothing to go overboard with. It's still the middle of May, but just a little something here. Just a little something to bring you back and get the juices flowing, get some skin in the game. Now that the NFL draft uh, has come and gone, the dust has settled. Uh, Brandon, at this stage, mid-May, uh, just give <laughs> us a brief understanding as to what you're thinking about and how you're processing information and what... Is there not... Is that this is actually a a more dead period of the calendar for the National Football League. There are rookie mini camps that are going to get into rookie awards here in a second. But uh, what are you considering methodology was? Yeah, as much of a dead period as the NFL allows us to have. Right. The NFL sure. is like a 13 month schedule at this point. We just keep <laughs> on coming. So for me, basically, I'm just looking I'm looking down the board here. If you're betting something right now, if you're going to give tie up your money in futures, for what, eight months, nine months right now, you don't want to be playing the favorites. This is not the spot to say, okay, well, who are the top four or five choices here? Uh, do I want the plus 100 odds? You can get that later. Like the number will be available later. We've got lots of time. There are going to be injuries. There will be signings. We'll get to see these guys in mini camp. We'll watch preseason. We'll watch hard knocks. It's all to come, right? We got months for all this stuff. For me, I'm, I'm painting for gold, right? I am looking at the, the top of the market to say, okay, who am I competing with? Ah, this market looks kind of soft. Let me scroll down the page a little bit. Give me a 50 to one, a 75, a hundred to one. Who might I not be able to make this bet on later because something might shift in those odds and I can't get this number later on. I need my long shot now. That's the point. These are like, give me a half unit, give me a quarter unit a 10th of a unit. If it's something really long, you just want to sprinkle. These are just add it to the back of my portfolio. Honestly, most of them will bust. If we come up with one or two here that have some legs by mid October, we will have done our job. So we're just trying to find something on the board that looks like it might have more value than what the number is. That's betting after all. Very good. Okay. So I'm fascinated by, we'll start with offensive rookie of the year. Of the quarterbacks that were drafted in the first round, a new NFL record, it's pretty safe and certain that Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels are going to start. They are going to start week one, we think, for the Bears and the Commanders, respectively. They're at the top of the board. The Williams number has come down since draft night, was around 3-1. to one. Now he's plus 170 to win Offensive Rookie of the Year. Daniels files in next. There's a drop-off there to plus 600. I'm fascinated by your handicap of these receivers taken in the first and second round and the other, which we'll get to the other quarterbacks that are quote unquote competing for the starting job, but it's more so to protect the, the teams protecting, not just the quarterback, but themselves from falling flat on their faces, such as the Patriots, the Vikings. Oh yeah. And in the middle there, the Atlanta Falcons, which we'll discuss. Uh, you've got a, a fascinating play there, but take me through your analysis of the offensive rookie of the year board. Yeah, so this is a great case to start with here. You, you cannot give your books money for Caleb Williams Rookie of the Year right now, eight months away, plus 170 at some books. Those are such low odds for We would have seen this guy play football at all yet in the National Football League. Mm -hmm. There are so many options. The top 14 picks in the draft are all offensive players. So this is theoretically a more loaded, deeper offensive rookie of the year field than we have ever seen before. We've got five other first round quarterbacks. And also, if you look back, you know my thing, we won't get too deep into the profile here. Only two winners for rookie of the year offensive in the last decade started the year plus 800 or shorter. You don't want the favorite here. The favorite is not where you want to go on this award. It is a quarterback award. Three of the last five quarterback winners, four of the last eight, seven of 14, 10 of 20. So about half of the time it's a quarterback. It seems like, all right, what was the story of the draft? Six quarterbacks. That's all we're talking about. That seems like the thing we'll talk about all year, that it's probably going to end up one of these quarterbacks. And sure, 
is Caleb Williams the right favorite? Absolutely. He absolutely is the right favorite. He was the number one pick. He's going to the Bears. A great situation, great receivers. I'm not saying he's not going to win a rookie of the year. I'm just saying we can bet it in August if we think he's going to win a rookie of the year. We'll get back to that later. You do want a first round pick. 17 of the last 20 winners have been first round guys. Uh, 12 of the last 20 winners are top eight guys. So you don't want to go too far down the board here. For me, that's why with so many names and a lot of short odds here, you got to be careful early on. I think Caleb Williams is a guy, obviously, to talk about again later. Some of the other quarterbacks, you know, Michael Penix, we don't know if he'll start. Bo Nix, I don't know if I want him to start. Like, Bo Nix is like a third or fourth oh, round a choice. Point, yeah. that I, you know, I guess I guess we have to have somebody play for the Broncos. Not a guy or a roster or a team I can believe in putting up numbers to win rookie of the year. That's another thing, too. We need numbers here more than winning. Winning will help, but we need numbers. Six straight rookie of the year quarterback winners finished as top 10 fantasy quarterbacks. So that, that's a good point to say, okay, I can't just come in and like game manage my way to winning rookie of the year. So that might be a spot where JJ McCarthy loses a little bit of luster. Maybe you say, okay, well, can he come in and just do the thing for Minnesota and just get them over the line to a playoff spot? Would that do the job? Well, historically you got to get some numbers here for me of the quarterbacks that's where Jaden Daniels looks really interesting because he's going to run he's going to get those running stats and look you know how I love love to hate on Cliff Kingsbury but Cliff Kingsbury was a coach when Kyler Murray won rookie of the year he raised the floor he got him out as a runner Kyler Murray under Cliff Kingsbury was a top 10 fantasy quarterback three times in a row to start his season, to start his career out. So offensive Daniels, rookie of the year, Kyler Murray. Exactly. One offensive rookie of the year as, as a top pick. So I think that the, it sets up well for him, but again, the best number I see for Daniels right now is plus 800. If I had to bet something on offensive rookie of the year, that probably is the play I would make right now. 800. Yeah, I could see that not number not necessarily being there a few months from now. Maybe we get a, a six to one or a seven to one. I think that would be my best play among the quarterbacks because of the fantasy upside. But, but again, when I say long shots, like just to clarify, you know this, Brandon. I'm not talking about seven to one or eight to one long shots. We are no, no, getting no. long down down the board. So to me, Jane Daniels is the quarterback that I'd want of my choices there. But that's kind of what I'm looking at among at least the quarterbacks starting out. Okay. Very good. And I think you brought up a great point about game management situation that that certainly plays a part. And um, yeah, it's a good call. Like, but like Bo Nix could, I guess in theory would be their QB one right now, but I don't know, Zach Wilson, Jared Stidham, maybe. Right. Well, that's, that's the thing too, with the quarterbacks. I, I didn't mention Drake may we don't know if some of these guys even will start at the beginning of the season right. which is another reason that why do we need to tie up our money in may for a guy that price whose price can only drop if you don't start the season you are going to drop in price for rookie of the year in august in september into october until you get on the field so i think it's a good spot to be careful there obviously the receivers are the other story here with rookie of the year the other guy that i would love to have a position on but again the number is pretty short Marvin Harrison Jr. is a stud. Marvin Harrison is going to put up the numbers. The Cardinals finally have a go-to receiver. Here's what that's looked like when Kyler Murray has been healthy the last couple of years. Two years ago, Marquise Brown, first six weeks of the season, here was his 17-game pace. Healthy Marquise Brown with healthy Kyler Murray, 122 catches, 1,375 yards. Yeah, that'll put you in the rookie of the year race if you can get those numbers. Last year, it was Trey McBride, rookie tight end. So the yards per catch aren't as good here, but his pace over nine weeks to end the season with Kyler, 113 catches, 1,143 yards. So why wouldn't Marvin Harrison get 100 plus catches and be a target monster as the guy? Like he's competing with Greg Dortch, Zach Pascal, Michael Wilson, uh, I guess Trey McBride, the tight end. Like these are the guys. And then Marvin Harrison Jr. Like he's going to get his catches. So I think, to me, of the receivers, he's a guy that I expect to have a huge season right away. You can bet him over a thousand receiving yards. I think that's a gimme bet. But again, it's a minus one ten, minus one twenty sometimes 
do I really need to win that bet? I can win it, but I don't really need my money tied up for eight months just to get one little bet like that. Mm -hmm. Among the other options, you know, Malik Neighbors, I don't know that I love betting on a Giants receiver, Daniel Jones, that system. I just don't get excited about that. Odunze, I love him, but he's probably the third guy in Chicago. And then you start to pay too much for some of the other options. Xavier Worthy, I'm seeing it like 16 to 1. We don't really know what his role will be in Kansas City. Keon Coleman, Lad McConkey. Now we're in the second round. Now we're kind of saying, okay, well, we got opportunity, but is it the right opportunity? Is it the right price? Again, there will be chances for these guys. These are the right names to talk about. To me, if I had to pick right now, I'd want to position on Daniels and Marvin Harrison, but I don't feel the need to run out and grab a position on these rookies. We, we've got time. There's there's much to be learned here still. Yeah, and I would just throw, you know, you got the Rasheed Rice thing going on right now with Kansas City. We're not really sure what his role, but that took yeah. some time from Mahomes to, for as bad as those other receivers were throughout the course of the year. It took considerable time for Mahomes and Rice to catch a rhythm. So that's just, that's not an indictment of Mahomes. It's just when you're as great as he is and as unpredictable as he can play, um, that that goes back to situation. He's in a great situation, being a, a Super Bowl quarterback and being being in it at the end. So, and, and when you give these, when you give out this kind of analysis, Brandon, things could go right for some of these rookies that could step in and get playing time. Just for the from a betting standpoint, just getting games, and then who knows, yeah. maybe a catch lightning in a bottle. <laughs> could also go wrong for certain people. <laughs> Like Kirk Cousins, you cynical, you cynical figure. Michael Penix Jr. There, there is something you are interested in right now in the Penix market. I, I, I can't get past this. I, I had to give you one crazy long shot rookie type bat for offense rookie of the year. Mm -hmm. You can bat right now on which quarterback will lead rookie quarterbacks in passing yards, and I'm gonna nibble our boy Michael Penix Jr. eighty to one to lead rookie quarterbacks in passing yards. So here's the case. If I told you right now, Michael Penix Jr. started day one, I think he'd be the favorite in this category. You got Drake London, you got Kyle Pitts. It's a good system. This is a team I wrote multiple articles about, man, the Falcons are such a great landing spot for a quarterback. Who will the right quarterback be? And then it was Kirk Cousins. And it should be Kirk Cousins. It's probably Kirk Cousins. What if it's not Kirk Cousins? We just watched this moron team pay $100 million to Kirk Cousins and then immediately spend the number eight pick in one of the most baffling draft picks we've seen on a near 24-year-old quarterback that is apparently the quarterback of the future. Nobody understood it. it like, I, I lost a bunch of bets because of it. I, I, I didn't cash my under four and a half quarterbacks. Why did Atlanta do it? I don't know. But isn't it possible, Brendan, if Atlanta is willing to break all the rules sure, to draft sure. the quarterback, why wouldn't they think about playing the quarterback? And if I look at the math here, 80 to 1, if I knew Penix was starting, I think I give him at least 30% chance to, to be the rookie quarterback passing yards leader. At 80 to 1, I basically need a one in 25 shot that he starts the season as the Falcons quarterback. Is there a one in 25 shot? I don't know. They're a pretty weird franchise. I don't know what they're doing. Why not? And, and again, this is one of those where something could happen tomorrow. The, the, before we're done recording, the Falcons could announce we're going to start Michael Penix and guess what? Now we have an 80 to one ticket on a, a plus 300 ticket. That's what we're looking for in the long shots episode is something where steam action, something crazy happens. And suddenly we're sitting on a gold mine ticket that we can hedge, that we can run. And, and that's what we're doing here. So that's my one offensive rookie pick. And now you get a flavor for what we're looking for on this here long shots episode. Yeah. I mean, look, you never know injury. God, I don't know if you could trade that contract right away, but uh <laughs> Kirk, I mean, Kirk he's, Cousins he's, he's is old and coming off the Achilles. You're right. Like, well, you got to mention that too. He, he might just, he might just be washed. He might just not be able to play or not be healthy enough to play. There are outs here for us. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's your offensive rookie of the year breakdown. The Michael Penix, eighty to one. My God. All right, <laughs> let's go to uh, defensive rookie of the year. Won't spend a ton of time here because defensive players were not uh, really 
they were they were not a, they were a dime a dozen here in the first uh, first round. There was not much love for defense in this uh, NFL draft. But you and now you put this out the night of the draft. The numbers come down on Dallas Turner in Minnesota. Yeah, I like Dallas Turner a lot for this award. With defensive rookie of the year, as with really any defensive award, any any league defensive award, you do want the favorites, right? You, you want the favorites. Nobody really pays attention to defense, so they just vote for the guy that everyone says is good at defense. And usually that's the guy that everyone thought was good at defense at the top of the draft. So for the last five winners, start of the year, plus 700 or shorter here. Seven of the last 10 winners, seven or more sacks. We just want flashy plays from dudes that you've heard of their name before, and that's Dallas Turner. 20 of the last 24 defense rookie of the years were top 15 draft picks. Now, Dallas Turner was 17th, but I'm going to count him here because if we're going top 15, it's one, one defender. We got one number 15 defender this year, Latu, who's the number two choice here, I think is probably a good case too. Dallas Turner, you're going to play for Brian Flores. He blitzed. 348 times last year. No one is more aggressive. Next highest is 288. So we're going to get a ton of blitzes. Daniil Hunter, 16 and a half sacks, gone. DJ Wanham, eight sacks, gone. Dallas Turner is going to get some chances. He even reminds me of last year's guy. You know, I was in on Will Anderson. That was our pick last year. Okay, Thank so what was the case? Draft a quarterback, draft an edge rusher, put him next to Jonathan Grenard, who's now in Minnesota. Let him come off the edge. Give me some sacks. Give me the award. I got some deja vu here. It's only around plus 500 now. This is the guy I want. This is the ticket I want. We get it at plus 750 the night of the draft. I don't really see this getting so shorter here. So we mention it because we're still out of the draft. It's a good spot to get on record here. This is the guy I want here. But I don't think you're going to miss out too much waiting too long toward the season. Uh, but Plus 500, I still like the value there. Yeah, it's fascinating, too, with that division. Uh, very good run teams. Now, we'll see what Chicago looks like in that passing attack, but young quarterbacks that are up and coming, of course, with McCarthy, we think, in Minnesota. Jared Goff had a great year last year, but teams that, that run the ball. Um, so I'm curious with that division sort of beating up on each other. Packers had a lot of steam coming in because of the run they made. Minnesota with the moves they've made. Now going young at quarterback. Lions seem to be legit, and then you've got – Caleb Williams and the Bears. So that just any market, and we'll get into that uh, more throughout the show, but any market that involves the NFC North is interesting. Okay, let's do MVP. Patrick Mahomes is the current favorite right now. Your thoughts on uh, Mahomes, and then we'll take it from there. I mean, Mahomes is the is the right favorite. Mahomes is the right favorite every season until we have some reason to believe he's not the right favorite, right? It's just Mahomes and they're set up well. The division sucks. They're probably going to go. That's a division, division that stinks. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like if you had to set the, the, the over under on division wins for the chiefs, it's over five and a half and you're paying juice if you want to get that one. So there's six likely wins. I don't really feel like the rest of the AFC did themselves a lot of favors. As far as who is that number two team in the AFC, I've got a candidate for you that we'll get to, but I feel like the gap, widen didn't close this year from a team that's already the best that already keeps winning super bowls so yeah chiefs win six division games they're the likely one seed guess what if you're the one seed and you're the quarterback and you're patrick mahomes you're gonna be like top three in the mvp race and you might just win it so quite frankly what what are we at i think plus 650 for mm -hmm. mahomes he's the favorite here I literally told you at the top, this is not a time to bet favorites. I don't mind if you bet Patrick Mahomes plus 650. I honestly think until proven otherwise, until either he or the Chiefs fall off, I would not start him anything longer than plus 300. So that's 25%. Where We're getting double the number here. If you are a player, if you're someone that either wants one MVP pick or somebody that wants to build a portfolio on MVP, you are almost definitely need Mahomes in your portfolio this year. And it's probably not going to get longer. Maybe at all. Well, you will see what the schedule looks like. Maybe they have a tough opening month and you get to lose a couple of games early or something like that. He's the right favorite. I don't mind you betting him right now. He's really the only one among the favorites that I'd even look at betting right now though. Can I tell, so I know you're going to get to this and you put this in our rundown and just looking at the odds. Now I hate 
maybe it's just me. I hate the, the list of quarterbacks <laughs> that are shorter than 20 to one. So it's going in uh, ascending order. Josh Allen at eight to one, CJ Stroud, Burrow, Lamar, Jordan Love, Herbert, Dak Prescott. That's who you got coming after Patrick Mahomes. I, I don't like anything here. What do you, what do you, what do you think? I'm with you. And again, it's not that these guys can't win MVP. Correct. But I am not putting my money on these dudes right now, in part because it's a long way out, and in part because, like, this is what, what, what I think we're agreeing on, Brendan, is the guy that I wanted to bet, whoever it is, oh, you know who I like MVP this year? Maybe Stroud, sophomore leap. What if it's him? Well, guess what? I have to pay him as the third or the fourth favorite now. Correct. So the book sniffed out the idea I had. It's gone. Oh, you know who I like? Who had a great end of the season? Jordan Love, my sleeper. Nope, not a sleeper. He's got the fifth best odds, sixth best odds on the board. So that's, I think, what we're hating here is th- there are no sleeper odds. All the guys that we wanted to bet as like a 30 to one or a 40 to one are 15 and 18 to one. So again, we'll, we'll do the whole thing later. We'll come back in August. We'll do the whole MVP breakdown. These are guys whose odds are too short to bet right now. And by nature of there being a bunch of them also reminds us that they're going to have a bad week on September 12th and they're going to lose. And they're going to drop out of this 20 to one odds. And you know, okay, you want a Dak Prescott? Well, great. The Cowboys are 0 2. Now Dak Prescott's 40 to 1. Now you can buy your Dak Prescott Scott stock later and build your position. So, again, long shots in May. You can't be betting from this plethora of, of shortish odds dudes here. So, to me, I looked right past that list. I've got two names from further down the list that I do think are worth adding that you can't get later. So, Let me start with one that we've heard plenty of. We've talked a lot about over the years. Aaron Rodgers, 28 to one to an MVP. I just think the number is too long. Listen, 28 to one prices him in this group of people as MVP favorites. Tua Tagovailoa, Matt Stafford, Richardson, Kirk Cousins, a running back. And four-time MVP Aaron Rodgers. What are we doing? Aaron Rodgers is a walking top 10 offense. When he can walk, he couldn't last year. I hope he can this year for this bet. He's literally won MVP two of his last three healthy seasons on the field. He's coming back from a blown Achilles at age 40 in New York for the New York Jets, who I think are going to be good this year. If they are, Rodgers will be part of it. MVP is a narrative award. What is the narrative better than blew out my Achilles? We thought his career might be over. Just kidding. Came back, still top five quarterback. See you later, Green Bay. I'm in a new location now. The Jets are great. We're doing fine. It's New York. I'm on every single primetime game. Mm -hmm. I'm Aaron Rodgers, baby. One of the best to ever do it. Give me the fifth MVP. There's no reason he should be getting priced as Kirk Cousins and Tua Tagovailoa. Get out of here with that price. I also feel like I, I haven't seen the comeback player of the year market yet, but it's almost like he's too good for that. Like he's too good. <laughs> and and if, he yeah, wins, he's... if he's the favorite there, you're getting just a much better price and him having a bounce back season. And should he bounce back, that means they're in the mix. Buffalo's worse. New England stinks. I think Miami... Still pretty talented, but the book's out on them, I think. I would like to think there's adjustments made to that team, and Tua in cold weather on the road is not the same guy. But, like, I would imagine Rodgers is probably going to be up there for comeback player of the year, so you're just getting a better price on a, on an MVP ticket. Yeah, I think he's even odds for comeback player of the year that right now. That makes sense. So, yeah, it, it does make a lot of sense. To me, it, again, this is not a Brandon says Aaron Rodgers will win MVP. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is – you read that list of dudes with odds 20 to one or shorter. There's no reason, unless I think Aaron Rodgers is just like irreparably damaged and never going to be able to play football again, which I don't. We thought he might play in December. Unless I think that, well, why isn't he, he in did. that list? Why isn't he in the list with, with Love and with Dak and with Hertz and all those dudes? I think he should belong in that list. That means that his odds are like a thousand to one longer than they should be here. 
So I think he should get moved to move up the list into the group of not Patrick Mahomes's. And then I looked a little further down the list. Okay, who's a real sleeper? Who's the real long shot here? And I actually have mentioned his name a bunch of times already. I think Kyler Murray at 60-1 to 1 to an MVP is priced way too far down the list. So the last time we got a healthy Kyler Murray season, it's been a minute. We haven't seen it for two years now. But the last time we got it, at the midpoint of the season, he was the favorite to win MVP. He was the guy. Now, I don't think he was going to win. I would have told you to bet against it at the time, but he was the betting favorite to win. And since then, we got a new real coaching staff, more Cliff Kingsbury slander. He's gone. I like Drew Petzing a lot. The way he ran this offense last year with zero talent, no expectations, nothing happening. They beat the Cowboys. You know, they, they, they were really good last year, early in the season. Back half of the season when Kyler was out there playing, this was the number one running team in football. Now, I know that's not really helping the stats case for Kyler Murray, but I think this offense could really be quite good. I don't know about the defense. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. If the defense isn't great, don't I just get more shootouts and more stats, more chances for Kyler to, to run and gun? His healthy pace... The first three seasons of his career, he was, again, top top 10 fantasy quarterback all three of those years. Here's his pace. 4,250 yards, 26 touchdowns by air, plus 650 and seven on the ground. Here's some other stats for you. 3,724 by air, 820 and five on the ground. That's Lamar Jackson. He just won MVP. Those are the numbers Lamar Jackson put up. And Kyler Murray clears those numbers by several hundred yards and a few scores on his healthy pace. I, so Brandon, here's where I came on this, how I got here. You know about Seahawks Island. You know about Texans Island. I'm already hunting my next island. And just a little tease, I'll be back in a future episode looking for islands I'm sort of kind of thinking about Cardinals Island. There's a little something here I sort of like, and a lot of it has to do with Kyler Murray. I don't know exactly how how ready I am to build on this island yet, but 60 to 1 Kyler Murray, if anything goes right for Arizona, if there's any island happening at all, Kyler has to be a huge part of it. And again, isn't he a top 10 quarterback when healthy? I think we mostly think that. We kind of forget about him because he hasn't been healthy. Why isn't he in that group of dudes at 20 to 1 odds or shorter? I see no reason to believe a month into the season when he's playing and looking good, why he wouldn't be in that mix. And now we have a really long ticket at a really nice number and a good way to add to our portfolio. I feel like I'm listening to someone who should be like the host of Survivor. And you're just making your way, uh, <laughs> deciding who is going to last on my island, who is going to be my favorite person on the island. Um, and you know the answer to your own question, and we'll get to this in August and September. But you always tell me, like, for MVP, you want to target a one or two seed guy that's going to buy. Right. Um, that, that's that, that's where the Cardinals, as you hit on their defense, they've just been so bad. Yeah. And Kyler's been hurt. Um, but I think you know the answer to your own question. So off of that, let's transition. You did a lot of the Cardinals already. I think we got your point on the Cardinals, but teams you're also looking to invest in. And you teased this a second ago, the Jets, which by the way, I just look back at the schedule when Kyler was the MVP front runner, Aaron Rodgers beat him head to head. And that's what gave the Cardinals their first loss of the year. And that kind of propelled the Packers. They went to seven and one that week, but that was kind of the, that changed the direction of the Kyler Murray MVP front runner discussion because he got beat by an elite quarterback and then Aaron Rodgers went on to have a great finishing um campaign that year. So there you go. Anyway, You're adding to my you... case. We we get yeah. both of them now. We get we get the Rodgers and Murray head to head here as our as our big position heading into the season. Look, the Jets are a team I mentioned earlier, the Chiefs are our number one in the AFC. You know, hooray. We we've really broken ground with that breaking news here. I think the case for who's number two in the AFC is really quite open. There are a bunch of like the, the, the teams that we knew were in the mix last year, I think all got notably worse this year. Baltimore lost a bunch of dudes. 
Buffalo lost a lot of talent. A lot of veterans are not there anymore. Miami had to let some guys go. A lot of salary cap issues. Cincinnati, they're in the mix, but they're, they didn't make the playoffs last year. Houston is the young. They're coming from the other side. They're the up-and-comers. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a real gap, though, from the Chiefs to the rest of the other teams. That's why and- my prediction, my prediction, I think Houston is going to be playing Kansas City opening night for that exact reason. Because if Houston loses opening night to Kansas City, no one's going to bury the Texans. They're the yep. next up and comer. They don't want to bury. If Baltimore plays them opening night, well, if they lose it, oh, the Ravens, they are who they we thought they were. Burroughs health, I don't think it would be Cincinnati, and I don't think you're going to put Harbaugh. Har- while Harbaugh would be fascinating, a division matchup nor- normally doesn't happen on opening night. That's why I think, just throwing that in there, I think Stroud and the Texans as the next darling in the yep. conference would, would be a suitable opening night game Texans Chiefs in Arrowhead anyway continue no I, I totally agree it just, just to give a little tease here for our listeners this is not a joke this is a real article I have posting this week as you are listening I have ranked God help me all 272 football games for this upcoming season from 272 to one on most exciting games and oh that God. game you just mentioned is number five on my list because I also think it's going to be the opening night game to start the season so there you go. Check the There's article step. out. I've literally ranked all 272 of them. Okay, back to the Jets. When we are betting on long shots, you are betting on outlier outcomes, not median outcomes. And that is the key to betting on the New York Jets right here. The median outcome I want no part of. The median outcome for the Jets is laughing stock. They've got eight different dudes who get hurt again. Things go awry. Aaron Rodgers is, you know, like, I, I don't even have to like, tell you Aaron Rodgers. Like, you already just thought of 10 things that went wrong with Aaron Rodgers. They signed Mike Williams. He gets hurt again. They signed Tyron Smith on the line. He gets hurt again. Elijah Vera Tucker is back in the line. He gets hurt again. Like, there are all sorts of reasons this goes poorly. As a futures better and a long shot better, when you load up your action app and you click on Brandon Anderson and click over to futures, do you know what was my top future that I had to sit with the entire season last year? It was Trey Lance to win MVP 50 to one. That was my top play that I put in in February after the Super Bowl. Hey, this number looks pretty long here. Let me just grab it. And for the entire year, I had to live with the stupidest worst ticket I could possibly have first thing on my profile. That might be the Jets. That might be this pick. Guess what? Because of that pick that I had led me later to add Brock Purdy at 50 to one, which was not such a bad pick to have in the portfolio. It turned out didn't catch. So can't victory lap it, but it should have been in the mix. The Jets are the outlier team to bet on here because what if Tyron Smith hall of fame tackle plays like a Hall of Fame tackle and stays healthy. Elijah Vera Tucker, what if he's healthy? And now they brought in Morgan Moses, John Simpson. These are names you may not know a lot about. The Jets had one of the worst offensive lines in football last year. And Brandon, you know, I start with the lines. And I think Hmm. this line goes from maybe bottom five to I've seen them rank top five right now. And I think that's a little aggressive. However, Aaron Rodgers, if he plays, makes his line look better. So that's another reason to think, okay, what if we have a lot better line here? And they spent their top draft pick on Fashanu, another guy that they hope to not play, but he's probably going to play because some of these guys will miss some time, but that's great. Now you want depth. You want that swing tackle to plug in. So the line is good. You got a top 10 quarterback in Aaron Rodgers, whatever version of that, we don't know. But again, we're imagining outliers. So we're getting, we'll call it top five Rodgers. Brees Hall, everyone loves him. Uh, Garrett Wilson, everyone loves him. And now Mike Williams, good receiver, big red zone target. Gee, you think Aaron Rodgers might like a big tall dude to throw to in the red zone? I think so. We've seen that for a lot of years. Uh, The defense is already great. We already know that. They added Hassan Reddick, a great pass rusher. Like, I don't need to make the case for the defense. Isn't it the best defense in the AFC? Probably. In the division, certainly. Why isn't it the best offense in the division? Why isn't it? If things all go right, which we have to assume right now, everyone's healthy right now, as far as we know, it's May. If things are right, I think this team has as good a case as any to be the number two team in the AFC. I don't know why they're not being talked about in that mix of teams. 
with the talent that's on the roster. The, the why is because we're afraid. We're afraid to look stupid, right? Nobody wants to be the guy backing the Jets again when it went so poorly last year. But guess what? If you have a season where you had the worst quarterback in a football situation and one of the worst offensive line situations in football, and you sub those out for a top five quarterback, maybe, and a top five line, maybe, that's not even a comparison. Like, you can't even, I can't tell you how big of a difference that that will make to a team's outcome. And that's why I got to the Aaron Rodgers MVP bet. I love Garrett Wilson, Offensive Player of the Year odds. He's 40 to 1. Receivers are winning this award lately. I know it was McCaffrey last year, but it's usually looking like a receiver award. The top guys in a lot of the odds are mostly receivers. You don't want Aaron Rodgers, clear number one receiver, a guy that's had really, really good metrics with like me and you throwing him the football. Now he gets Aaron Rodgers throwing him the football. I think I want that ticket. I think it's going to be half the price by the time we get to the season. And again, long shots in May, you need your Jets stock now because I'll tell you this, the prices are already fading. I wrote about the Jets a month ago, and since then the prices are already starting to drop down a little bit because people are, are, are liking the Jets. And if people like the Jets, it's New York, it's the media. They're going to get talked about when the schedule comes out. The Jets on my ranking of all the teams are one of the highest, like they're going to be in all the games, Brendan. They're going to be on Sunday night and Thursday night, and they're going to be in London. They're going to be like Aaron Rodgers and the Jets. They're going to be on TV a lot. We're going to be watching a lot of them. We're going to be talking about them. And look, it might go very poorly, but there is a lot to like about this team. And if things go well, there's no reason it can't go as well as anybody in the AFC. So I think there's a spot to invest plus 240 in the division. A little short for my taste as far as this time of year, but certainly a ticket I'd want if it was August right now. 14 to 1 to come out of the AFC, 28 to 1 to win the Super Bowl. 28 to 1, they're pricing the Jets equal to the Chargers and the Falcons. The Chargers and the Falcons. Look at the roster. Look at the talent. What are we doing? This is a team that can be as good as anybody. And you're pricing me with Justin Herbert and a bunch of losers on the Chargers. And then Kirk Cousins and Michael Penix fighting in the locker room. And then I get all the talent on the Jets. Which one do I want? I want the Jets. That's it. Well said. That was good. I um I get it. <laughs> you got me riled up, Brandon. It's May. Yeah. And like just it go back and watch hard knocks leading into last year. Like now that was <laughs> a lot of public casual steam, I think, that came in on the Jets. I know a lot of folks at Action Network dabbled on the Jets to win the Super Bowl the minute the deal went down when they got Aaron Rodgers. But even like just the discussions with Sala and the staff and the connection with Garrett Wilson was apparent, which speaks to your pick for this coming year, and then their lack of line play. And I was very proud of the Jets to draft uh, Vashanu. And I'm not, I'm not even a Jets fan. It's just like, wow, they did the mature thing. They didn't go after Bowers. Yep. They could have had a Dunze. They could have had another receiver. They made the mature move, and they didn't let the quarterback – if he wanted the weapon, influence them. They made the mature move for their organization, never mind who their quarterback is. Okay, so we did the Cardinals, did the Jets. There's another team in the NFC yeah. that you'd like to discuss, the Philadelphia Eagles, after having a god-awful December and they fell off the map. And Is that your, is that your Carson Wentz jersey? It, 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 of course. It's the only Eagles jersey I own or ever will own. I am not a Philadelphia sports person, Brandon, as you know. But I am a fan of making money, and I think the Eagles are going to make us money this year. To me, again, after the Super Bowl, I wrote about who are next year's X, who are next year's Chiefs, who are next year's 49ers, who are next year's Lions. There's a world where the Ravens win the Super Bowl that we just had. And everyone wants to know who are next year's Ravens. They were the story of the regular season. They were the, they were supposed to be the answer to the season. Like they were they were the team that was supposed to be there at the end. And if you look at the Ravens, what do they have? Organizational stability, good drafting, trustworthy signings. This is what the Eagles are. They went out. They had a great draft. They brought in two corners: Quenyon Mitchell, Cooper DeGene, probably the top two man corners in the draft adding to a secondary that quite frankly just got old and wasn't good anymore last yeah. year. The exact thing this team needed, they nailed it in the draft. They added a couple of linemen. They they tend to draft quantity and 
quality, throwing a couple a couple names at the pick. Uh, they they added a safety, another spot that was weak last year. So that's that's another Baltimore thing. Baltimore always great in the trenches. That's the Eagles. They focus everything on winning on the offensive line and the defensive line. Now I know Kelsey's not there anymore, but Jeff Stoutland, the offensive line coach, is as good a positional coach as there is. That line is always a priority. It's going to be good again. The defensive line, they added Bryce Huff there. They're trying to get younger. Our guy Jalen Carter, that conceded rookie of the year so we could win with Anderson. He's going to be really good next year. So again, trenches are good there. And then the thing that I think we would have focused a lot on with Baltimore is they went out and, and Harbaugh is still there, but they got those new voices, right? The story of the season was Mike McDonald, the awesome defensive coordinator, and then uh, Todd Munkin on Todd offense, Munkin. just doing new yeah. things there. So what did Philly do? They lost their coordinators a couple of years ago after the Super Bowl, both became head coaches. And last year was a disaster. So the guys are gone now. Now is Kellen Moore running the offense. Now is Vic Fangio running the defense. Vic Fangio, I don't need to sell you on him. Like he's he's a legend as far as defenses go. In Miami Kellen got Moore, better defensively, a, I thought last year. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Kellen Moore has done a great job also. Didn't go great with the Chargers last year, but the, the Eagles certainly know him. Like he led a lot of Dallas offenses for years. Sure. You know what you're getting there. They also added Saquon Barkley who I, I think is probably a little bit overrated from draft expectation lore, but is a home run threat that you got now. Barkley can take it to the house and you play because you've got Jalen Hurts, the power run. You got A.G. Brown on one side, Devontae Smith on the other side. Like This is an offense that can run with anybody. It's a defense that should be a lot better. And quite frankly, I'm looking to fade the Cowboys. We'll come back to that in the future episode too. But it's a very last dance sort of feel about that team that's all in, they say, and did nothing. They're just running it back with the same retreads that fail every single year. Yeah, because they're going to get Belichick. That's why. Yeah. Jerry Jerry Jones has said it. They they got to ride out the McCarthy contract. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, Yeah. I I just, the, the Eagles to me and the weaker NFC are a spot to invest again plus 125 in the division i think is a is terrible i think any plus number is a great spot to have eagle stock but it's a long ways out 750 to win the nfc 1700 to win the super bowl again the odds are shifting a little bit we've already lost a little ground from a month ago when i wrote about this but still good there 15 to 1 to have the most wins we just saw him do that two years ago that was a bet that we cashed right here on this podcast nick sirianni coach of the year 40 to 1 if if the coaching story is what it was with Baltimore last year, bringing on Kellen Moore and Vic Fangio, he gets some credit, right? He, he's the guy that brings in the new voices and gets everything going. And man, Philly just won 14 games again. They're always right here, back at the right. top. Like last year, we're, we're focusing on how badly things went for a month. The Eagles are good. The Eagles are always good. They're always in the mix. I think you you want Eagles stock. It's It's one of those like, it's like telling you to, to to buy Apple stock, right? Like it's just going to get more valuable. It's just going to only get more valuable in time because maybe not after that commercial that we should be <laughs> after what just happened. But well, the, the Eagles are just a bet on stability. And I, I like a lot of the stuff there. I like what they've done. I, I just have loved their off season from a team that already was good anyway. So it's definitely a team that I want to have some positions on heading into the new season. Similar to our discussion about Rodgers, there is a comeback player of the year market. If there was a comeback coach of the year, Nick Sirianni could very well be, would be like up at the top of that board, right? Um, so yeah, the narrative. Yeah, because because there was talk about should should Nick Sirianni get fired, right? Correct. So suddenly, suddenly you win 13, 14 games. He's, he's apparently not fired. Apparently he's looking pretty good. So that's a good narrative swing. You see, you, you're making the points for me again, Brendan. Yeah. Well, and I think, like you said, for the key to Sirianni when they were successful two years ago was their, their coordinators, high level coordinators. And I think, like you said, Kellen Moore and then adding Vic Bangio, those are two pretty substantial names to, uh, you know, make sure the coach gets out of the way. I don't like Nick Sirianni, but it sets up well. That's a good price. Okay, lightning round. A couple more, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, these are more uh, running back, wide receiver centric. These are, this is the, this again is the early NFL long shots episode. <laughs> You're getting long here. Why don't you throw a couple in, and then we'll uh, we'll get out of here. Yeah, we're long. So rushing leader is a market that I've got my eye on. Here are the odds favorites right now to lead the league in rushing yards: Christian McCaffrey, Jonathan Taylor, Saquon Barkley, Brees Hall, Derrick Henry. 
that to me reads like, oh, I'm going to want to invest in this market because I don't believe in the favorites here. Saquon and Henry, they're not going to get enough touches on those new teams to lead the league in rushing. McCaffrey, we're not getting two healthy seasons from McCaffrey in a row. So I'm already easily ruling out some of these options here. So that tells me, okay, look down the list. Who do we like? So who won rushing title the last five years? Here's the list. Starting from five years ago, Derrick Henry, two years in a row. Then Taylor, that's why he's on the list. Josh Jacobs, departed from the Raiders. And then McCaffrey, usually around 1,500 yards. So I've got two picks I like here because they fit exactly that list. First one is probably my favorite long shot on this entire episode. Zamir White, 50 to 1 to win the rushing title. Zamir White plays for the Raiders because I feel the need to tell you which team these guys play for on all three of these picks because that's how far down the board that we are. If you play fantasy football, you know who Zamir White is because he was probably on your winning fantasy team last season. Last four games of the year, 84 carries, 397 yards. So 100 yards a game, over 20 carries a game. Antonio Pierce took over and said, smash mouth, hard knocks, run the football. We're, we're doing this the way I like it, right? That's his style, and that's the coach. They kept him. So why shouldn't I believe we're going to keep running our star running back? Jacobs was out. Jacobs is gone now. So isn't it just Zamir White leading? Alexander Madison is on the depth chart. I'm a Vikings fan, man. I've seen plenty of Madison. That is not your lead running back. That's your That's your backup. So Zamir White, I think, has a real chance to get like 300 carries for a run-heavy, run-first offense whose offensive line is definitely built for the run, whose quarterback is Gardner Minshew. So it's not like we're going to light things up by the air. We're going to get a lot of rushing yards. If you take those four games and pace it out, that's 350 carries, 1,700 yards for the season. Again, 50 to 1. We're down the board. I Honestly, here's why I know I like this one best. I had to look like last night, like I found this a week ago. I had to look again last night and again this morning to make sure the number hadn't disappeared. I had to check the depth chart to make sure there wasn't like a different dude they drafted or signed. I was like, why is he so far down here? I thought he would be like seventh, eighth, 10th on the board of odds. I don't know why he's 50 to one. So he's my favorite pick here. Okay. Very good. Zamir White. I mean, he was like, he was just on the losing, like Kyron Williams for the Rams was on that same kind of path the back half of the year, but he was on a contending team. He was just on the bad team that played well, that no one really had interest in because the Raiders were a dumpster fire. Another running back. So and I, I think Samir White was the only one I think you had to mention, at least for me. I mean, the other two I'm pretty familiar with. Um, but I do remember last year doing a pod very much like this with Raybon and a friend of the pod, Matthew Friedman, and they were doing yeah. – most improved kind of guy and Zamir White made their list. J- Justin Fields did too. But anyway, they got they got a lot of the other guys right. <laughs> You're going to Pittsburgh for another running back uh rushing leader. Yeah. And I'm going with the running back that's actually good in Pittsburgh, whose name is not Najee Harris, is Jalen oh. Warren. We've talked about that a lot, right? We did that a lot of times yeah. on if our Najee podcast. Harris was on your fantasy team, you probably didn't win or make yeah. the playoffs. It, well, you might have, because you might have been bad enough to pick up Zamir White and then have him at the end of the year <laughs> instead of Najee Harris. So Najee Harris usually gets like 250, 300 carries, but 3.9 yards per carry for his career. Here's the key. They didn't pick up his fifth year option. So that tells me we have made our choice on you, Najee Harris. We are no longer tied to the Najee Harris futures business. Interesting. Jalen Warren averages for his career 5.1 yards per carry. Now you can't just extrapolate that out. He's a smaller dude. I don't know if he can necessarily handle a huge carry load, but five yards a carry You don't need 300 yards, five yards a carry, 250 carries. We're at 1250 now. And don't forget the other name in Pittsburgh that's new, our guy, Arthur Smith. Arthur Smith sucks as a head coach, really good as an offensive coordinator. His teams in the last five years have been top three in rushing attempts and top three in rushing yards, three of the five. He was the guy that led Derrick Henry to the rushing title two of these five years. So this is my Derrick Henry pick. It's Pittsburgh, right? We're going to play defense and run the ball. This is what the Steelers always have been and always will be. We got Russell Wilson and Justin Fields. Like you said, they're, they're going to hand the ball off. Like I mean, hey, Smith, like, think he's just going to be like, Oh, 5,000 yards passing leader. That's what I want this year. No, I want to hand the ball to Jalen Warren. Well, when Russell Wilson was at his peak in Seattle, you had a running game with Marshawn Lynch. So exactly. if they're trying to get anything out of Russell this year in a, 
a, a one year prove it kind of year that that bodes well too, just systematically. Exactly. It's it, again, hundred to one. This is a bet on. Hey, it's August tenth, and they just announced. Hey, you know what? We're watching preseason games. Jalen Warren's running with the starters. Isn't that interesting? He's gotten t- twelve carries. Najee Harris didn't play till the third quarter last night. Did you notice that? Suddenly the odds flip, and suddenly Jalen Warren's like twenty to one, and Najee Harris is getting the hundred to one, which is I think how it should be priced. That's what we're looking for here. We're just looking to nibble a little bit. My last guy on the list is another hundred to one. It's a receiving yards leader for our producer Matt Mitchell from his Buffalo Bills. Give me Khalil Shakir, who was good at the end of the season, right? He was really good as Stefan Diggs started to kind of fall out of favor there. But again, looking at history, 2020, the bubble year, Stefan Diggs led the league in receiving yards, 1,535 yards that year, two seasons ago, 1,429 yards. So we have history of, a, of one target in Buffalo getting a lot of targets and a lot of yards. Diggs. For the last four years in Buffalo, averaged 111 catches, 1,343 yards. He gone. Gabe Davis, he gone. There's, there's nobody left here. It's Khalil Shakir. It's Curtis Samuel, who is just going to be like a third guy. And it's Keon Coleman, top pick of the second round. I think probably the touchdown leader on the team. He's got good size. I don't think he's going to be putting up a lot of yards or stretching the defense here. You know, look, Dalton Kincaid, Dawson Knox, they're probably like the real, quote, number ones on this team in most scenarios. Shakir is really good. If you look at him, when they switched from Ken Dorsey to Joe Brady last year, he went, yeah. Shakir went from under 25 snaps a game to over 50 a game. And he finished the year at 0.89 EPA per target among all receivers that ranked number one. The rest of the top 10 is like Tyree Kill, Puka Nakua, CD Lamb, Nico Collins, Brandon Ayuk. Go up the list. Khalil Shakir. Now, let's again, it's sample size. Like, let's not let's not pretend he's going to just suddenly be the next superstar receiver. Josh Allen's going to throw the ball to somebody. Somebody's got to catch some passes and get some yards. This is, again, this is the guy to me that's like fantasy sleeper. Everyone's buzzing about Khalil Shakir. Did you see the preseason game? Two catches, 130 yards, and a score. Holy cow, Khalil Shakir. Trying to catch lightning in a bottle. This is my one more chance to catch some lightning. He's fast, so let's get a little lightning from Khalil Shakir, exact same size, body weight, height as Stefan Diggs too. Why not? Stefan Diggs was like a fifth round pick. Again, Vikings fan. I know my guy Diggs. Why not Khalil Shakir? Why not another 100 to 1 to end our long shots episode? <sighs> Brandon Anderson, you have a way, my friend. You are a machine. <laughs> and now I want spring to be over and I want training camp to, uh, to get here. Great stuff. Brandon Anderson, find him in the Action Network app. Uh, We will return to the Action Network podcast this week for our Preakness Stakes episode that comes out Thursday morning, along with our weekly traditional UFC episode on Friday. Then next week, Brandon and I will be back covering uh, NFL playoff underdogs, along with the return of Stucky and Raybon talking NFL win totals. So get excited for that. Yes, we are dabbling into more NFL because as I, I was saying off the air a second before we started the pod, the NFL is such a giant now that they are now doing announcements about the announcement of the schedule. That is where they are. That's where we're at as the machine that is Brandon Anderson and the machine that is the National Football League. Thanks so much for listening. For Brandon Anderson, Brendan Glasheen, we'll catch you next time here on the Action Network podcast presented by BetMGM. MGM.